Okay, thank you for everyone uh, joining. So today is the continuation of our uh, previous session. Um, uh, today is session seven, and uh, the topic is uh, the second part on the screen, which is computing trends. So we briefly uh, started uh, discussing uh, architecture of the microprocessor uh, uh, the last session. So I thought we'll spend more time um, on this uh, topic, uh, which I believe is a fun topic. And uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Kumaraguru um, and Professor uh, Shanmugapriya, who will we'll be also likely joining shortly for today's uh, session support, and also Vishnu Priya and Professor Mala Nehru for the previous session support. And um, sir, I'm with... here, sir. Uh, so good evening, sir. So this Hello. is Shanmugapriya, sir. Hello, Professor Shanmugapriya. Please, uh, yes, uh, thank you for joining. And, um, thank you, sir. And welcome to the to the sessions. I think uh, we have uh, your support for the next few sessions. Uh, we appreciate uh, sure, your participation. Sir, sure. Thank you so yes, much. Sir. Thank you, sir. All right. So. Um, Without any further ado, let's jump into where we were last time. So we we were here um, looking at uh, um, microarchitecture or computer architecture, actually process architecture from above and below. So there was a top-down view, and then we alternated between a top-down view and a bottom-up view. Um, this picture here, uh, to refresh our uh, uh, memories, uh, shows a program written in a high-level language that a human being can understand, a program written in C, which essentially prints uh, Hello World uh, 500 times, Hello World 0, Hello World 1, and so on up to Hello World 499. And the right side is what the hardware sees in terms of, in this case, it's an assembly language or um, machine code, if you will. Um, so the, to, to set the stage, we started here and then um, again went uh, to a bottom-up view where we revisited uh, all the way, uh, how, I mean, what transistors are, and which are essentially switches, and how a processor, uh, the block diagram on the right, shows a processor connected to a memory and interacting through wires, essentially bus. So with this uh, uh, preliminary introduction, um, I, I thought today we can begin with, uh, again, another uh, bottom-up view where uh, uh, how a processor is actually made. Um, this is something that usually um, textbooks uh, uh, don't spend a lot of time on. So um, since uh, I work for Intel um, now, so I thought uh, we could uh, maybe look at some of uh, Intel's uh, uh, fabrication slides a little bit. I mean, uh, just a disclaimer, none of this is uh, uh, official Intel um, material. It's just uh, um, we'll use or look at uh, some public information that is available off of Intel's website. So um, the credits are for uh, in, um, the copyright stays with Intel. We're just making fair use of it from, from the public uh, web. So it's an old, uh, relatively old presentation, uh, but the um, but the pictures are nice. I thought. So how how is a processor? Uh, how is a chip made? Um, it turns out, as we saw, all, all um, semiconductors uh, predominantly are silicon based today, and at least uh, in, in CPUs or uh, processors, it's made of silicon today, and silicon comes from sand. So uh, it all. Uh, um, is built from sand. So the picture on the screen shows uh, um, a, a sand, and then um, sand basically uh, uh, treated at very high temperature, melted uh, to produce uh, melted silicon. And um, from um, metal silicon, which is actually, it's tried to be made very, very, very pure, extra pure, um, a single crystal silicon is grown. And we call this large cylindrical silicon that you see on the um, uh, the picture on the right. It's called a silicon ingot. Um, so uh, it's it's about uh, maybe a foot in diameter. It's pretty heavy. It's uh, 100 kilograms or so, right? It's uh, pretty heavy. That's where it all begins. You begin um, any uh, fab or a, uh, manufacturing uh, company manufacturing chips um, takes these uh, ingots or even um, uh, the next stage of it as inputs. So once an ingot is uh, uh, made, 
uh, they're sliced to, to what are called wafers. So uh, they're sliced into these thin, maybe a millimeter thick um, uh, slice called wafers. So that's the picture that you're seeing on the left side is uh, the, the ingot being sliced. And on the on the right side um, is a is a sliced thin thin wafer itself. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not really going through the um, uh, the texture uh, in much more detail. I just wanted to give a flavor uh, of uh, what the process is. So um, once you have uh, such a wafer, then comes um, the, the main uh, part, what is uh, uh, what we call as photolithography, but uh, in common terms, it's actually not very different from uh, uh, maybe a, um, if you remember good old analog photo development. Um, it's really not uh, different from that. So uh, in a uh, analog uh, uh, camera, your uh, film is developed by applying. Uh, uh, chemicals to it to wash away parts that are uh, 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 of the uh, picture and uh, that's how a film is developed right so same thing here in a photo lithography basically the the wafer um, there is a, a photoresist applied on the wafer in um, after photoresist is basically something that uh, does not allow light to pass um, after you apply uh, photoresist uh, then there is uh, ultraviolet light. I mean, because of very tiny wavelengths of ultraviolet light, um, the ultraviolet light is uh, passed on through uh, basically lenses, through uh, uh, lens and and masks. The masks show the pattern of the, the processors in, in design, basically. So the light passes through the mask and hits some parts and does not hit some parts and so on. It, it creates a pattern in, uh, on the... Uh, on the wafer, and after the, um, uh, the the regions that are exposed to the uh, uh, light, uh, they are actually they harden. Right? So it's uh, um, and the rest of the part is uh, you you wash it away using using chemicals. So there are patterns formed on the on the silicon wafer using this this photoresist as the as the next step. We, we call this lithography. And then, uh, I mean, if you remember, the transistors are made up of uh, with uh, doping the semiconductors with uh, some extra positive and negative ions, whether it's boron or phosphorus and so on, right? So it's uh, the process of doing that is uh, what's called as ion implantation. So um, all of the um, ions are, um, I mean, in the in the regions of interest, um, you're actually implanted. I mean, uh, using by bombarding them with those those ions essentially, and that's how a transistor starts to form. Um, and it's not just the silicon that makes the transistor. There is uh, many, many layers on top. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the next uh, picture that uh, we are seeing here is, is etching. So to, to precisely, um, a transistor has uh, um, uh, three different uh, terminals and uh, the, the fin or the, the vertical, um, uh, like a wall that you see in the middle is formed by uh, etching away. Or, or taking away the the silicon that's uh, not part of uh, that structure, basically. So um, that that's what we call as etching. Uh, uh, not to go into too much detail, but really, there are many many more other materials: um, silicon dioxide um, or other insulators, metal, for instance, copper, and uh, uh, there are other uh, um, uh, dielectrics as we call them. So there is uh, other layers that are actually deposited, just like how a, a building would be built, um, uh, one story after another. So um, you, you add, uh, I mean, copper, or and then um, these. Um, essentially, the picture on the right side shows these are wires, basically. So uh, you you put together all these uh, transistors and then connect them through uh, essentially wires and metal. And, and this happens over many, 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 many stories. Uh, by stories, I mean a, a building that's vertically organized, right? So it's um, so it's extremely complex. The structure is extremely complex, and um, uh, that's how um, by by organizing them in layers is how a chip is built. Um, when once your uh, the wafer is fully formed, so it's uh, um, in a, in a full wafer. Uh, a same pattern is repeated many, many, many times to print maybe many processors. And then um, all those, uh, we call them 
the dyes. So the wafer is then sliced through to create individual dyes. So in a large wafer, you could have many, many dyes. And that I mean, uh, they're, uh, the picture on the right side, right side uh, a robot is essentially picking each dye for packaging individually. So it is that dye that then, um, if you um, take, I mean, the picture is on the left here, shows an individual dye. And then that is packaged so that uh, I mean, everything's protected in a what typically we see as a chip is, a, is essentially the package. And then that package needs to have uh, leads like solders or, or pins to connect that chip to the outside world, essentially. So this packaged part, the, the packaged thing is tested, um, make sure it, it uh, functions electrically and, and uh, structurally and so on, and then finally packed onto the, the boxes that we uh, uh, get to see from our store or uh, um, on our computers, basically. So this is a, a quick, like an overall uh, um, way of how a, a processor is uh, made or fabricated. And uh, uh, it turns out that this, uh, I mean, the, the process of making chips is actually very expensive. Um, it's uh, today, if you want to make uh, a, a chip in what is called as a leading process or a very current cutting edge uh, process, it costs tens of billions of dollars to, to build a new, new fab. Uh, a fabrication unit is called fab. It takes tens of billions of dollars to do that. Um, I mean, it is actually... Uh, I mean, if you if you look at it, the it's larger than the GDP of many nations even. Um, so why is it that expensive? Um, it's very expensive because uh, a lot of the um, uh, I mean the equipment is very high tech, and each of that equipment, whether it's uh, optically to to um, uh, I mean all of these tools uh, to to focus one particular wavelength of light, um, all these tools are very um, very expensive as well. And there are many, 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 many such steps. There are, so in a, in a um, state of the art uh, fab today, there are hundreds of that such steps and um, each step um, is uh, done by equipment that is uh, worth tens of millions of dollars. And I mean, you may have seen this picture of a, a bunny suit, right? A, a clean um, suit, uh, which I think we are all now more used to after the, the COVID and seeing um, th this bunny suit uh, uh, and it's common for all fabs because the clean rooms inside a fab are, are extra, extra, extra pure. You, you can't have even a, the smallest dust particle in um, uh, in the in the tiniest way. So they're they're uh, one of the cleanest uh, um, or uh, environments uh, anywhere. And to maintain those and uh, all of these, uh, to, to purchase all these uh, high um, cost equipment and running them, uh, it's very expensive. So uh, practically speaking, there are only a, a very few companies that are able to do fabrication today. Um, very few, very big companies are, are, uh, uh, are the only ones that are in this business. So, uh, I mean, we are seeing that making chips is, is very expensive um, but designing them um, and uh, is actually becoming easier uh, to do so we, we will come to that towards the end um, uh, but uh, at this point I wanted to pause uh, see if uh, students have any any thoughts questions all right um, so the next, uh, uh, we'll switch again from a top-down, sorry, bottom-up view to a top-down view now. Let me um, use uh, animations now. So we looked at uh, how a, a CPU or a processor is built from uh, ground up, practically from sand to silicon. Um, let's now take the other approach. What uh, what happens if you look uh, top down? How is a CPU organized? Um, so to uh, we'll first illust illustrate this uh, notion of pipelining. Uh, some of you may may have already studied what pipelining is, uh, and it may be a refresher. So let's take the example of a, of a car assembly, right? So let's say we have a car and let's say the car is made up of three parts. I mean, pardon my um, 
poor mechanical knowledge of uh, kg if there is uh, um, all these are uh, um, very rudimentary but uh, i'm going to assume that a car is made up of three parts a chassis uh, and then the body or top and then wheels on the side that's it that's that's my car let's say so um, and let's say uh, there are three robots um three robots c b and w so uh, c for chassis robot b for uh, a body robot and w for a wheel robot that actually work together to assemble the car um so if they uh, work together and let's say each one takes about an hour to do its job uh, the car would be assembled in about 3 hours so that's that's what we are uh, showing as the picture on the side but when this happens you see that uh, when robot c is working b does not have a job Uh, and likewise when uh, b is working um, c and w do not have a job one, one robot works on the car at a time let's say you'll see that uh, the the time it takes for the car to be built is about 3 hours so that's what we call as latency so the latency is about 3 hours to build one car on the other hand i mean the, the reason why cars are so popular is because uh, i mean the uh, uh, car manufacturing industry uh, optimizes this optimizes this very well so um, what we uh, call today as an assembly line is all these robots standing in in one uh, like a train basically where and then the cars moving in a big uh, uh, line uh, one after the other across the robots so um, if your uh, uh, chassis is being built for the first car um, by the robot c and then after the chassis is built the car is passed on to the robot b that builds the body and then the the chassis robot is not idle now it starts to build the next uh, car basically so the cars are uh, arranged or they move in an assembly line fashion um and they are built one after the other what is the advantage of this right so previously um you were able to make one car in 3 hours that does that does not change even now so in in the long um uh, maybe a, a, the assembly line flow of the cars even now the car uh, takes 3 hours to build so first in one hour at the c robot one hour at the b robot and one hour at the w robot but if you look at the exit outside you stand outside the factory and keep looking at how many cars pass Uh, you will see that one car is completed every hour so this uh, the rate at which the cars are produced we call that throughput so the throughput now is not uh, one car every 3 hours like before but one car every hour and um, this is exactly what happens in um, in a in a processor so we saw that uh, a program a high level Uh, written in a high level language is uh, really what the hardware sees is a bunch of instructions and these tiny instructions flow through a pipeline um, just like how cars flow through assembly lines so they flow through in a pipeline and the processing happens um, in uh, in what are what are called as pipeline stages and so it's the just like in an assembly line cars uh, flow through the pipeline in uh, in case of uh, processors instructions flow through the pipeline so in a, in a car factory you would say oh uh, the, the let's say the work happens from 8 am to 5 pm or, or so and then the clock that uh, is, maintains the time is uh, any clock uh, on the real world um, but inside the processor though it's it's magical time it's not the clock in the real world but it's actually a, a clock that is also a signal it's a uh, that it's a beat it's like a metronome in music that uh, periodically um uh, 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 basically uh, turns on and off on and off uh, repeatedly and that's the frequency with which or the speed with which it turns off is in the gigahertz range so you, it uh, the clock uh, operates billions of times turns on and off billions of times in each second so it's a really high speed clock um, i mean I, i call this magical time for for uh, for our purposes Uh, which is uh, uh, what happens in each clock tick so even whenever there is a, each clock tick um, the the instructions flow from one pipe stage to another pipeline stage basically so in each beat it's as if in the assembly line the car moves from one robot to another robot so um, this is how um initially at least performance uh, improves so if you um take a car that was it took um 3 hours to make now we were able to make one car every hour so how do you speed it up further i mean um how if you want to um I mean get to really high speeds and make uh, many instructions uh, finish every many instructions uh, within a short time 
how do you do it? Let's, uh, let's take one approach. We can say, okay, I'm going to take these uh, robots and make them more efficient. Each robot. So the C robot, the chassis robot, instead of taking one hour to build the car, what if it learns to work fast and it can uh, complete the chassis in 30 minutes? Now, um, the, the B robot, likewise, uh, you, you say instead of uh, one hour, it, you complete it in 30 minutes. Um, the W robot, similarly, uh, instead of uh, finishing in one hour, it finishes in 30 minutes. So this is exactly what happens when you make, when this transistors that build the CPUs become smaller and faster. Um, so that is the, that's what we're showing in the picture um, on the fourth or the, uh, uh, the second from the bottom picture. So smaller, faster transistors uh, cost one level of speed up. So essentially you can, um, you can clock the circuit or the clock the CPU at a higher uh, rate. But that is not all. You can actually do more. Uh, let's say this uh, robot is now faster um, and more nimble, but what that's not sufficient for us. We want to uh, make even better improvement. So we went from uh, one car every three hours to one car every hour to now uh, two cars every hour, one, one every 30 minutes, and that's not good enough. So what we do is we take each robot let's say the C robot, B robot, and W robot, and then chop them up or basically have three different robots. Um, so instead of one chassis robot, let's say we have three uh, chassis robots, one chassis robot looking at uh, the front of the car, one chassis robot looking at the middle of the car, and one chassis robot looking at the rear of the car or something like that. And uh, I mean, originally for the whole chassis, it took us 30 minutes. Now with three robots, you probably add a little bit of time for uh, coordination between them. So it's not exactly 10 minutes per car, it's maybe 12 minutes per car. Uh, so sorry, 12 minutes per uh, uh, stage. So what happens is the picture that we show at the bottom. So with finer pipelining, if you, uh, what you've done is uh, you're now able to produce one car every 12 minutes instead of uh, where we started, one car every three hours. So this um, is what happens when you pipeline in a, when you take a pipeline stage, a larger pipeline stage and break it up into smaller pieces um, that can be um, sub stages of a, of a pipeline essentially. So um, uh, this trend of uh, uh, smaller, faster transistors and also finer pipelines um, essentially led to the rise of uh, uh, increase of clock frequencies. So um, when I used to be in, uh, uh, in college 20 years ago, uh, when uh, our labs uh, used to have a, a 386 machine actually, which was, uh, uh, and then used to be all thrilled about uh, uh, new uh, systems that were Pentium systems. The, the clock frequencies were in the megahertz range. Uh, now, today, we're talking about clock, re clock frequencies in the gigahertz range. So that is uh, three orders of magnitude or even more uh, increase just in the uh, clock frequency. How is that possible? We, we'll come to it, but it's essentially through these two approaches, smaller, faster transistors and finer pipelining, basically. Um, so this is a, a top-down view of what happens in a pipeline inside the CPU. So uh, before we now go to the, the bottom-up view, let me pause to see if uh, there are any thoughts or questions. All right. So now let's go to the bottom-up view. Um, so in 1965, um, Gordon Moore, who was a co-founder of Intel, he made an empirical observation. We, we call that empirical observation. Um, as Moore's law, so but it's really not a law in like any any law of, uh, law of physics. Um, uh, uh, it's not science. It's an observation about human ingenuity. The object the observation goes like this: the, the picture on the right side shows um, on the x-axis years ranging from 1970 to 2020, and on the y-axis is the transistor count, number of transistors inside a chip, in logarithmic scale, and each point is a particular chip, basically, um, uh, that was released in that year. So, <coughs> excuse me, you see approximately that it's, it's, a, it's a straight line. Or, uh, I mean, if you squint, it, it kind of forms a straight line pattern. What does a straight line mean in, the, um, uh, in a logarithmic scale? Um, it means that because you're going from 1,000 transistors in 1970 
to 50 billion, billion with a B in uh, 2020, that's, that's a 50 million times uh, increase. And so a straight line in the logarithmic axis is uh, exponential um, in a linear axis. So we are, uh, um, the, the, so Gordon Moore's original observation was that transistor count, um, the number of transistors in a, in a uh, chip doubles roughly every, every two years. Um, that was the observation that he made. Um, and that has really held for a very, very long time. Um, and we, as uh, uh, we have seen in the, um, uh, I mean, from uh, being part of the pandemic, we know what exponentials are. Um, exponentials are extremely powerful uh, functions. So uh, what this has done is uh, the, the, the fact that you can put uh, more transistors into that same space means that for about the same amount of material, for the, about the same cost of roughly, same cost of material, you can now pack much more functionality. So what used to be um, part of big, humongous uh, uh, machines that occupied computers, that occupied buildings, whole rooms, now it is, uh, uh, we are able to put it in our pockets and on, as phones or maybe watches or something. Um, it, and it's so tiny. What computational power is available on our, uh, on our phones today is uh, uh, even just a few, uh, a decade ago or a little over that, a couple of decades ago, it was possible only in supercomputers that uh, were available in large rooms. So uh, it, this is the, um, uh, what we, when we say Moore's law, uh, we talk about this uh, relentless uh, progress of in the density of transistors. But naturally there is a, uh, a correlate or, a, or a, um, a side effect of, of this, uh, uh, behavior, right? We call this in uh, in the, uh, I mean, Bob Dennard, I think, or uh, uh, F, uh, Dennard is his last name. He had originally uh, uh, suggested a, a scaling means where you, if you, um, when you make transistors smaller and smaller, you shrink them and put more of them, um, it turns out that, that each transistor can now operate at a lower voltage and you can clock it um, at a higher frequency. Um, so this, uh, while retaining the um, the temperature, or in other words, it's uh, power dissipated per unit area, so the temperature remains constant, and um, your uh, energy spent in the chip is lower. So with the, if you uh, for the same power, um, you actually you can uh, same power density and actually lower power. You can even pack more transistors in there. So this uh, uh, approach of uh, um, uh, I mean, shrinking not only created more transistors, it created more uh, efficient uh, systems. So this was the case for a very long time. Um, so both uh, more slow and then it's scaling um, really, uh, I mean, w went really well for a very, very long time. So uh, practically speaking, uh, I mean, performance came for free. Um, if you had the software that that ran really slowly on a, on a particular system, all you had to do was wait for a little longer. The next generation of the uh, system would have much faster uh, hardware. And performance practically came free. Um, uh, like a, uh, And this was magical. Um, but this is not true anymore. It actually, actually has not been true for a very long time. Although the, the number of transistors doubling is still holding, um, then it's scaling is long gone. So we don't um, have lower and lower voltages and increasing and increasing frequencies uh, every generation. Frequency and voltages have been uh, fairly flat for a very long time now. Um, so uh, those are, uh, I'll come to what kind of um, challenges exist in, in innovating and scaling performance, but uh, uh, just uh, wanted to uh, spend some time to refresh uh, our uh, thought about what we may commonly hear as uh, in, um, in popular news articles and so on, you would hear Moore's law and then it's scaling and so on in, in many um, common uh, places. So I just wanted to make, make sure we took a few moments to, to address it. Okay, now let's go back to our top-down view. Um, so there is Moore's law um, and there is uh, ever increasing um, uh, transistor density and we are still at a, clear, uh, at a pace, maybe in the nineties um, uh, where, uh, still performance practically came for free. 
mean your your transistors uh, were smaller your frequencies were were uh, uh, faster and faster every generation uh, Dennett scaling was all going great now um, how do you um, then um, uh, make use of this uh, faster transistors um, what can you do with them how do you gain performance out of them uh, the the way it was done um, in single core CPU systems, in where your CPUs, your uh, processors had one CPU, was exploiting what is called as instruction level parallelism. So um, what that is, is uh, we saw on the picture on the right, basically we saw um, that uh, uh, the, the pipeline that we discussed previously. So the, one, the top picture is uh, a single pipeline. The technical term for a single pipeline is a scalar pipeline. Um, so, where as uh, the instructions from a, a program or instructions from a binary flow through the pipeline in a single file. So you have, it's like a single line of instructions that keep going in order. So uh, like a, maybe a, a, a group of uh, students walking in a single line or like a, a group of soldiers marching, the uh, instructions flow through in exactly the same order that they are in the program. So we call this an in-order behavior. So single pipeline, in-order CPUs uh, that were really finely pipelined and uh, your frequencies kept increasing. That was how performance um, uh, improved for a very long time. Um, so uh, we called that single core performance improvement. I mean, there are a lot of uh, um, innovation that went through it, but at a very high level, that's, that's what uh, 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 CPUs were. And then from a, a scalar pipeline, now how do you uh, increase performance even further? Um, what you can do is uh, 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 basically take that uh, single stream of instructions and then split them out into uh, multiple streams. Let's say you, you have a single stream of instructions and then you, you split them into three different streams and then feed them into three different pipelines that are parallel. So you, you, that is the picture on the, the, the second picture on the right. And we call such multiple pipelines where the instructions still flow through in sequence in like a in a in a in a in the same order that they were in the program. That is called an in-order superscalar processor. So this word superscalar means there are many pipelines, there are many parallel pipelines where instructions flow through. So that is the picture that we are showing on the in the middle. Superscalar in order CPUs. And even today, um, I mean, many there are many uh, CPUs that are uh, in order uh, uh, super scalar cores or even scalar cores. It depends on um, if it's a teeny tiny microcontroller, it could be any of these. Um, uh, but overall, uh, if you're talking about the leading uh, uh, CPUs of the day, whether they are in, in a phone or a, a tablet or a, a laptop or a desktop, um, or, a, or a big server, um, the, the leading uh, designs were uh, uh, moved in this, this fashion, right? So it's, uh, it's from a scalar CPU to super scalar CPU to what we call as out of order CPU. What is out of order? Um, the picture in the bottom, uh, you see there is an instruction stream flowing through from the program and there is some crisscrossing uh, arrows. So what those crisscrossing arrows are, are essentially the, uh, the instructions are rearranged into different pipelines depending on which instruction is ready to execute. So let's, uh, uh, that kind of rearrangement, uh, reordering of instructions from what we call as an instruction window. So um, you have the entire program, the hardware now looks at maybe uh, a large number of instructions, let's say a thousand instructions, and then looks through the instruction window to see, okay, these instructions are ready for me to execute. So I'll pick those things and then execute them. Not necessarily in the same program order, um, but then I can't just uh, uh, I mean, put things together in a haphazard manner because uh, there is the logic in the program that has to be maintained. So you can't just execute them out of order and be done. In the end, of course, you'll have to reassemble the, the results in the same order that they were in the original program. So that is uh, what is called as out of order processing, where you process the instructions, not necessarily in the program order, but in uh, as and when instructions become ready to execute. So let's take this uh, 500 uh, hello world example, right? Let's, uh, I mean, I'm gonna uh, at a very high level uh, approximate this. If you look at it, we printed all the hello world strings um, at the, um, in, in the end of the program and uh, hello world zero and hello world one and, and so on. Um, but if the, um, 
the strings that form as inputs to these printf's so the string or the string hello world 0 or this uh, string uh, uh, this uh, hello world 1 and so on they can be computed um, independent of each other you can compute all of those uh, strings parallel to one another independent of each other and then in the end when you print them you can print them one by one uh, uh, by printing it onto the screen so this is uh, this the fact that these um, strings are all independent an out of order cpu exploits it it not adjusts at the uh, whole string calculation level but at every instruction level so at a very fine grained granularity it looks at oh this instruction has this data ready it can go this instruction does not have this data ready so let's wait and and so on so this is what happens in an out of order um, processor we um, and so we briefly alluded to uh, a notion of an instruction window or a large uh, 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 buffer of instructions that uh, the processor maintains to go through and find independent uh, instructions so it's like a a large uh, buffer of uh, um, a queue of instructions um, so uh, the the a large buffer where instructions come in one uh, put in one end and they are taken out on the other end and they flow through and this buffer will however give you a window of instructions that the processor can look into and then um, pick instructions that are ready to execute every clock cycle so this uh, size of this large instruction window we call it uh, depth of a, a cpu we call it a depth of a, of a machine and then the number of parallel pipelines that shown on the picture so on the on the picture on the bottom we have three parallel pipelines so three uh, parallel tracks where uh, this execution can happen the um, that number of parallel tracks is called as um, uh, the width of the machine so in any uh, uh, out of order or any any core any cpu this is the general terminology so you have a width of a machine and the depth of the machine and you size them based on what your needs are um, so now uh, i mean this is all fine and dandy we have talked about uh, how uh, performance uh, um, uh, just uh, i mean uh, scales uh, amazingly through these techniques of uh, pipelining and out of order processing and so on but what is the catch uh, the catch is uh, there are many um, constraints or challenges in making this happen so if you recollect the the, the robot example the um, uh, the original car assembly robot example what happens if the robot is ready to work but there is no car coming in it, that robot will be empty uh, not doing or without any job for for a little bit of time uh, we call such an empty uh, pipeline uh, uh, stall or an operation as a bubble so there's usually um, uh, when you have a long pipeline the possibility of uh, uh, bubbles increases and um, uh, why does this happen it happens for various various reasons um, we will highlight the most important of them which is uh, it turns out that we we talked about processors and memory and the, the cpu or the logic um, uh, i mean the transistors improve and the frequency improves it gets faster uh, uh, quicker while the memory um, is not that fast so there is always a performance gap between the processor and the memory so memory is usually much slower than what the processor uh, how how fast the processor can operate so uh, the situation then is if you if the processor is very fast so it can get the activities or jobs done very quickly and then it would sit waiting and these waiting cycles are, are a problem you're basically throwing energy at something that is not doing any useful work so this gap between um, the cpu and the memory we call that as a as a memory wall and there are uh, many techniques by which you try to overcome this memory wall but the the fact that uh, the cpu and the memory are in uh, very different speeds is a uh, is a challenge that one has to it's a constraint that we work with and not just the memory wall the other is of course you only have a finite battery or um, even you can't supply uh, power fast enough um, so the other uh, challenges are also are physical in that laws of physics is the same for all of us 
So the power um, uh, consumption is the, another, is, the, is the other challenge. So if you have a laptop or a, a tablet or a phone, you I mean the processor can only work as much as uh, uh, the, there is battery life in it. So the processor should learn to sip power, if you will. Energy efficiency becomes extremely important. So you can't just uh, keep throwing um, increasing performance at the cost of power. It has to be energy efficient performance. And not only that, there is uh, the challenge of heat. So when you have these transistors switching fast in very, very tiny spaces, it generates, it dissipates a lot of uh, uh, energy and uh, it uh, creates heat. So there is uh, a lot of heat dissipation that if you don't take it away using techniques such as maybe fans or heat sinks and, and so on, then your uh, chip will melt or it would, uh, your chip will stop functioning. So, um, and the amount of heat that you can take away from um, a, a system is uh, really uh, proportional to the, the cooling system that you have. It used to be that uh, you'd have just, uh, uh, just a heat sink, no fans on these CPUs, then on, on big systems. Uh, in gaming systems, you may have heard, uh, um, uh, I mean, fans whizzing and running and, and so on. Um, so it used to be uh, just uh, heat sinks that, were, uh, that did not have any fans. Then there used to be fans that blow air and take the heat away. And these days there is even better. We have even more expensive systems that cool using liquid cooling. So you uh, uh, let oil flow through some channels and take the heat away from the CPUs through liquids. So the, the cooling systems are also getting more and more expensive. And um, we have been trying to challenge or try, trying to solve this the uh, heat removal problem. So these are all challenges to scaling up performance indefinitely. Um, so how do you then um, address these challenges? How do you balance this uh, um, single core performance with all of these constraints that are memory and um, power and thermals? So the, the answer to that is um, go to a next level of parallelism or thread level parallelism, which is uh, now you know how to build a single core efficiently, single CPU efficiently, just put many cores on them, many parallel CPUs so that you can run one program uh, on each independently. And um, uh, so that's what is called as a, a multi-core or a multi-core CPU. So we put many CPUs on the same die. Uh, the picture on the, on the right essentially shows two cores connected to some other blocks. What they are is uh, uh, are called as caches. So you have this, uh, we talked about the memory wall. The memory is farther out and it's really slow. So how do you... Um, uh, uh, basically buffer um, memory close on, to, on the chip. So what you do is it takes a long time to get data from the memory or RAM. So you have some uh, uh, cache or on-chip storage called caches, um, just like uh, a cache of a, of a browser cache that we are all familiar with. You just say, oh, clear, can I clear the um, browser cache? It's the same thing. The concept is the same here. We um, store um, uh, uh, data that is more frequently used closer to the uh, CPUs on die, basically. So these caches are on die memories that store frequently used data from the memory so that you don't have to go to the memory all the time. So if there is a lot of reuse uh, that is happening, the, uh, the core will not wait for memory. It has all its data in the cache. It will keep running, humming very fast. And only when that data is not available on uh, the chip uh, in, in their caches, only then do you need to stall or uh, pause execution and then go to memory to get the, the information. So this, uh, what we call this uh, uh, as caches are part of memory hierarchy. You, we see um, uh, some names here, L2 and L3 and I dollar, dollar is cache, uh, D dollar is, is cache. What these are, are so the, if you look at it, the uh, blocks that are closest to the CPU are smallest, but also very um, fast. It takes very few cycles to access this, the first set of blocks um, on, on the right. And then it takes longer uh, to access the L2, which is the second level cache. It takes even longer to access L3 or the third level cache. And these are sized correspondingly too. The, uh, the first level caches are split into two, instruction cache, which stores the program instructions and data cache that stores programs data that it operates on. So uh, L2 is level two cache, which is shared, which means it has both instructions and data. 
And L3 is also shared, not just in instructions and data, but also it's shared uh, across cores. So if you want uh, many parallel programs to talk to each other, let's say your browser wants to uh, talk to the operating system or the network uh, stack or something, then such uh, communication actually in the hardware happens through the shared uh, L3 cache in this case. So it is a means, this memory hierarchy is not only a means to hide memory uh, latency, but also a means of communication between um, cores. So uh, this is what um, uh, exploits mean uh, multi-threaded programming or uh, running independent threads uh, on uh, on the uh, CPUs, basically. The, uh, the programs that you're running on these cores could be different. So you could run program one on core one and program two on core two. They don't have to be the same. They can be the same or different. It doesn't matter. They're very flexible. So the architecture of the CPU is such that you can have multiple instructions and multiple data. This is what uh, the terminology we use, MIMD. Um, and multi-core systems are MIMD systems. You can run any uh, program on any core and uh, independent of each other. So it's very flexible and uh, you can really program uh, uh, it offers uh, practically freedom for any programmer to do whatever they want to uh, uh, implement, basically. So uh, we talked about multi-level caches already. So this is one way of um, uh, exploiting thread-level parallelism. But there is another view. We have uh, heard about GPUs or graphics processors, which take a different view of this thread-level parallelism, where uh, you're not... Um, uh, 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 the picture on the right actually shows a sea of graphics uh, uh, CPUs, which I mean every laptop today, every phone today has both CPUs as well as GPUs and some specialized units will come to that later. The, um, uh, the, the difference is in a, uh, uh, I mean, we talked about an out of order, big humongous CPU and a large part of that uh, hardware you look at it, the area, a large part of the area is occupied by these multi-level caches that are all used mainly for data movement. This is great, but what if your application is embarrassingly parallel? You, you have, uh, there's a lot of computation to go and there's not really a lot of synchronization or orchestration needs to be done. So uh, for such workloads that are very parallel, and it turns out that graphics workloads are extremely parallel, it, you really don't need the complexity of a big CPU trying to orchestrate these out of order uh, um, pipelines and so on. So a simple in order course that also uh, are what we call a SIMD, single instruction, multiple data is sufficient. What it, what it means is it is the same program that runs on all of these cores. So instead of uh, parallelly running many different programs, a GPU has to run the same program on all of these cores, lockstep, basically. It's like uh, multiple uh, 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 groups of people marching together. So it's the same program that executes in all of these cores. What happens if you're, uh, uh, if, you're if you start, uh, I mean, end up waiting for memory when a, when a program or a thread uh, waits and it does not have the data that it needs to operate on, it waits, immediately that thread is switched out and other thread can come in. Unlike in an out of order CPU, where it uh, instruction level parallelism is looked at and then you try to do a lot of uh, uh, reordering to, to get instructions and so on, in a GPU, it's actually much simpler. It says, okay, there are, uh, we have a lot of threads, thousands and thousands of threads. So we don't need to bother about this one thread and try to do more work on trying to find information. We'll just switch that thread out and bring another thread in. So that is called as, um, uh, I mean, this is another view of highly, uh, high thread level parallels, extremely, or in, in technical term, we call it embarrassingly, parallel applications can take, um, make use of this uh, highly parallel architectures. I think we are uh, uh, about 10 minutes now. So let's maybe, I'll try to be a little uh, quicker here. So versus CPUs, in comparison to CPUs, this kind of an extremely parallel architecture provides much higher arithmetic density. So you can, uh, if you consider, oh, how many adders do I have? How many multipliers do I have? And if I look at how much area of the chip is allocated to uh, compute actual adders and multipliers and dividers and so on, versus data movement, which is caches, it turns out that the GPUs have much higher arithmetic 
uh, intensity, much higher density of compute. Uh, so there is, uh, as you can see, there is fewer uh, uh, resources for data movement, you know, complex uh, uh, multi-level caches and so on. Uh, there are caches, um, but not as in the same complexity of a, an out of order CPU. And also you can see that uh, previously we showed two CPU cores. Here we are talking about 64 uh, GPU cores. So there is much higher number of cores, but all of this uh, does not come for free. There is a, when you get some, you give some. The, the, what you lose is the flexibility of programming. A CPU is much easier to program um, while uh, we can, you can have many uh, independent uh, uh, programs interacting with each other. They can all have different uh, pathways or control flow. In a GPU, those are, those are challenging. There are much more, the interactions have to be much more uh, limited and it has to be in a particular fashion. So programming them is not as flexible as in a CPU. So what you gain in performance, you lose a little bit in programmability. Okay, so uh, we uh, so in terms of history, we were talking about uh, trends in computing. So we went from single cores to multi cores to GPUs, and then um, something magical happened. We, there were uh, th these deep neural network algorithms that were available since 90s, which are turned out to be extremely parallel. They are embarrassingly parallel, and they turn out to be perfect fits for a for, for the architecture like a GPU. So once the hardware GPUs started avail get becoming available within the last decade, in about uh, uh, the, uh, then the AI algorithms that were developed much earlier were able to run on them very well. So immediately there was an explosion of the size of the um, neural networks. Um, uh, and that's the, uh, the magic of uh, all the AI revolution that we are seeing before our eyes uh, today. So the, the, but this is enabled not just because of the, um, the algorithmic improvements in uh, deep neural nets. It is actually because the hardware allowed you to take advantage of those algorithms. Um, so that, uh, which has now resulted in um, an explosion of model complexity. We call this the Cambrian explosion of AI uh, to, in alluding to the uh, Cambrian era of uh, evolution where uh, um, the eye started appearing. Um, there was uh, um, once the uh, eye uh, uh, vision started appearing in uh, uh, biology, there was a lot of diversity of uh, biologi biological species. And very similar to that, once we have seen cameras and vision started appearing in computers, the computers are diversifying like anything. I mean, uh, there are flying computers, the, the drones or wearable computers or driving computers, all of these are computers. Um, so there is a, a diversity of uh, uh, computing that's happening today. And the picture on the right is an exponential that shows uh, all just uh, language models. These are all natural language models um, and uh, their complexity as uh, in the last few years, uh, 2018 to 2021, you see that the model complexity went from anywhere from a few million, hundreds of millions of parameters to almost a few trillion parameters. So it's like a, a exploding need for compute is happening today at AI. So if you have such an exploding need for compute, um, GPUs aren't even sufficient. They're not even efficient because they're, uh, uh, I mean, both CPUs and GPUs are very general purpose. You can reuse them for any algorithm. You can program them. Yes, CPUs are much more general to program, uh, to program but you can still program the GPUs. So they're still programmable, they're uh, general purpose in that sense. So what if now you, you're, there is a thirst for compute and there are uh, challenges of power and thermals and so on, so it's not, um, we are not able to scale performance like we did all the time by just uh, newer architectures and, and newer, sorry, newer general purpose architectures um, by using single core, multi-core CPUs or GPUs, thread level parallelism, instruction level parallelism, uh, it, it's not sufficient. We need to be really um, innovative to pick problems or pick hardware for special purpose. So if you have uh, uh, one particular activity that happens in the hardware, designing the hardware to suit that particular purpose. So it's not general purpose, it's special purpose, but doing so special purpose hardware produces orders of magnitude energy, uh, sorry, efficiency and um, throughput improvements. So the example that we'll take is a, is a deep neural network where matrix multiplication is the predominant operation. So it turns out that uh, in for such neural networks where matrix multiplication is the main operation, you can actually eliminate a lot of on-chip storage. Even in the GPUs, there are on-chip storage, we call them 
registers you can eliminate all that because you don't uh, necessarily only have uh, uh, threads that uh, interact with each other you can actually have uh, data flow through it in a um, in a much uh, more elegant manner um, so uh, this is how a, uh, a tensor processing unit that google uses uh, in their data centers for instance works um, so i was going to go maybe look at a matrix multiplication example um, but I don't think we have uh, um, too much time for it. This, uh, I think uh, uh, it's reasonably self-explanatory. So uh, it, I'm just going to show you um, this piece of hardware at a very high level um, is what is called a systolic array. Um, is, uh, this is a, a simple way by which uh, matrix multiplication can happen. You have an array of uh, compute elements that uh, all these uh, uh, squares here are just uh, uh, multiply and accumulates. So they just multiply the two numbers as its input and adds them out to the previous, uh, accumulates them. So um, uh, you begin with a, a one, two, three, four as a matrix. In this particular, you organize the data in a particular fashion and the data flows through like how heart pumps blood through the cells. So that's why this is called a systolic array. So, uh, heart beats are systoles and diastole. They're actually, uh, uh, how your heart pumps blood. So using that as the example, um, these special purpose hardware, maybe the takeaway for you is you can design not these general purpose uh, CPUs, but really special purpose hardware that is good at doing one thing really well. Um, so because we are in that era now, um, uh, to be able to design special purpose hardware, um, the other uh, trend or uh, in the future, what we are seeing is that you design hardware and software together. And what uh, was possible with respect to the speed of software design, I mean, you, previously we could design, I mean, software companies could be made for uh, a very cheap price. So you can start a software company with practically very little resources. It wasn't the case with hardware. In hardware, it used to be very, very uh, difficult to do so. Those things are changing now. Your uh, hardware companies as well, are you're able to start them much uh, with very little resources because of utilizing the same things that the software world did. Very, uh, what is called as agile development methodology or open, uh, open source softwares and hardware. Today, because of all that, we are able to, uh, the innovation has gotten up really fast. And um, the, the future is really bright for this hardware software co-design. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Um, this is going to be a, an optional exercise for matrix multiplication on the different architectures, but let's skip this. So, uh, I mean, uh, one of the things that uh, you're all six semester students, if this kind of topic, whatever we talked about, is of, uh, of interest to you, uh, a couple of project ideas. You can uh, maybe as an individual or maybe as a group of uh, both hardware experts and software uh, group, maybe electrical engineers and computer science folks, you can join together maybe do implement, build something um, of, of really uh, non-trivial complexity. So maybe an open source smart camera where both the hardware and software is designed. There, is a, there are open source instruction sets called RISC-V. In IIT Madras, there is the Shakti CPU just across the road from our campus. You can use those and maybe even there are open source neural network accelerators. Can you put them together maybe to create an open source smart camera? That's, that could be an idea. Or if uh, you're more inclined to do software, um, there is uh, this open source uh, uh, tool chain called as RISC-V based tool, tool chains available. Can we build more tools to enable others? There are some high quality binary uh, compiling tools in the other advanced instruction sets such as x86 and, and ARM. Can you bring those advanced tool chains to RISC-V is some other project idea that uh, I want to throw out. Um, okay, uh, really, I think we are uh, out of time now. Um, let me, uh, there is a bunch of uh, links that, uh, relevant links that uh, that are at the end of the files that you can take a look at later when you have the time. Um, and uh, please, uh, uh, I know we've rushed through very quickly, but I hope you'll have some time later to uh, take the survey for session seven. Please give me um, feedback on what you learned. Um, there is a... Yeah, any questions? At this point, I think uh, um, we are done. Let's, so maybe open out for a few minutes of questions. And the reminder, the next session is tomorrow. So this week we have 
um, uh, not just Monday, Wednesday, we have three sessions. So the next session is tomorrow. Professor Suresh Subramanyam will be talking about general networking principles. It's tomorrow at 7 p.m. And the following sessions, there are going to be some change in timing. You will have a couple of sessions a little later, I think 9 or 9.30. I will um, send you the right timing. But uh, just some heads up before we, we close. All right. Um, sorry to rush through, um, but I really wanted to see if uh, you have any, any, any more questions. There's a, there's a question on chat, um, if you could see, or I can read sure. it out. Let me do that. So materials to learn, uh, basics of pipelines, hazards, etc. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, the uh, let's go back to so this professor Honor uh, Mutlu. He is a professor at ETH Zurich. Um, all of his lectures are available um, online. Um, if you would uh, prefer watching videos, his videos are great. Maybe I would begin with uh, and likewise his advisor, Professor Honor's uh, advisor. Um, is Professor Ail Pat. He's uh, from Austin, um, University of Texas at Austin. His lectures are great. Um, and uh, if you prefer reading, uh, there is, uh, I would say, the, the golden book for computer architecture is uh, uh, Hennessy and Patterson. So um, uh, it's a, there are two uh, big books, essentially one for undergraduates. This is called Computer Organization and Design. And then there is the more advanced one that is computer architecture. So quantitative approach, computer architecture, a quantitative approach. So all these are more classic textbooks. I think your libraries may have them. Um, they have a wonderful treatment of uh, pipelining. Um, uh, so I would encourage you to look at either of those. And at any point in time, if you have any questions, I mean, I'll be happy to answer uh, any student questions. Uh, you have my email. Um, and if you want to even schedule like a one-on-one -on -one session where we can chat about these things, where we can maybe explain it in more detail, I'll be happy to. So just, just email me and we can do something. There's a small group of students who, um, uh, who want to um, uh, maybe reach out or something. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that. 